Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Rim Shots with Sean, brought to you by Barstools and Bantock. I get this gentleman all the way from one of my favorite places. He won't know it, but uh, I've been to New Jersey a bunch of times. Love it. Mr. Steve Zing, brand new project, Black 29. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. So, we got the presser from your gal, and um, I'm going to paraphrase, but basically the vibe that I got is uh, you and, and, and your, your partner, Daniel, were just sick and tired of waiting around for people and just said, the heck with it. We're just going to go and do this on our own and see what happens. That is correct. You know, I've been in many band situations before. And of course, you know, when you're a band, you're two, three, four, five people. And uh, it, the band was a lot of fun. It was great. And but people wanted to go in different directions. And, you know, getting a band together isn't the easiest thing in the world. And nope. keeping a band together is even harder. So when our old members of uh, this band, Marriage Drug, that we had, decided that they wanted to go their own ways, you know, it was it, it was back to Dan and I and, and sitting there going, you know what? Let's try this on our own. And that's exactly what we did. Um we recorded one song. I never, Dan is really a bass player and I never realized he was that good of a guitar player until we started recording. And we did one song, we wrote and recorded it. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. So we just continued. Um, now <laughs> you, you always throw something out like this and you go, oh, okay, I hope, I hope that, uh, I say this and it's not, uh, the wrong thing, but I'm hearing a ton of different influences, but your voice, and one of my favorite singers is Ian Asbury from The Cult. This song, you're, you're laughing already. Um, I'm getting that vibe, and hopefully that's not an insult to you, but uh, that's the vibe that I get. Look, it's definitely not an insult, and and I've, I've heard it many, many times. Um, uh, I can't say Ian is an influence of mine. Mm -hmm. I really like Ian Asbury. I love The Cult. When they were Southern Death Cult, right? I mean... Uh, but it's kind of interesting that a lot of people pick up on that. And maybe it's because of the way I, you know, uh, and uh, enunciate the words or whatever, maybe, but, uh, I've, you're not the first <laughs> to say that. And, and trust me, it's, it's an actually, you know, I find it quite an honor that I get compared to someone like Ian, because I always thought Ian had an amazing vocal style. And distinctive. Very much so. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of it, and, you know, I don't want to rip anybody, but a lot of what you're hearing, I guess, from, I'll say, 2005 and on are people that were influenced by, say, Eddie Vedder. You hear an awful lot of Eddie Vedder in there. And, I mean, whatever. But, I mean, Ian Asbury, to me, is just, you know, a very – so I, I didn't think it was an insult. I hope you didn't think it was an insult not, because it was no, like, well, it, No, no, not not at all. Perfect. And it's more of an honor. Um you know, when Dan and I get together and write a song, it's it's kind of like someone says, "What are your what was your influence to write this song or that song?" There really isn't an, an influence, right? Per se, I never wrote songs. And one thing that Glenn Danzig taught me early on, he's like, "Whatever you write, you're the one that has to be happy with it. No one else. Don't write for anyone. Don't write for." what's ever you know big that's going on because that that train will come and go right for yourself because once you write something especially from let's say the late 90s on that thing lives forever so you're the one that has to be happy with it so i you know when we write songs it was never like we're going to write a song that sounds like the cult never did that um and uh, but I just, you know, we there are songs that we didn't even put on the record because you, you, you kind of sit there and you go, ah, eh, maybe that doesn't work this time, maybe the next time. But I tried to do this, you know, this ebb and flow thing where it's it's kind of like it takes you on a roller coaster ride, right? There's songs here, there's songs here, the songs here. So it's kind of like I tried to, you know, um, again, we didn't write in in that particular vain to go we're going to do this it just wound up working like that well i love uh, uh so some praise um and 
you, you can you can name the, the person that says it because I just think it's amazing. The record is amazing. It's like the best NYC smelling dark groove rock and roll album that I've heard. Um, you immediately, if you haven't heard it, and I have, but if you haven't heard it, you immediately get this vibe from it because it is groovy, but it's also dark. It's it's you know it's a cool cool vibe. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a description of what I've heard so far. You know, that was from Yerky69 from the 69 Eyes, who who is on two of the cuts on the CD, which are two cover songs that the label had asked me to do uh, as a duet with him. Uh, and when it was come time, when it came time to pick the songs, I was like, what am I going to pick that I can do a duet with with another guy? So I went back to songs that I, you know, remembered as a kid. And I'm like, well, this I think could work pretty cool. You know, I remember, you know, the Hollies, a long, cool woman uh, in a black dress. And then, of course, the Kinks Destroyer. I thought was to me, this would be perfect for for what we're trying to do. I actually thought of actually because I'm looking at your shirt, your kiss yeah. shirt and yeah. this thing in the background there. And I was a huge early kiss fan. You know, when I grew up, right, I grew up on three things. 50s music, all right, Elvis Presley. Well, four things, Kiss and punk rock. I'm just trying to do my part to send Nick and Sophie to college there, Steve. You know what well, I'm saying? I just heard Sophie got married. Well, good for her. Good for her. Um, so you did the vocals. You did the drums. Um, did the drums and vocals for everything in it except the two cover songs uh, is Tommy Victor on guitar and Johnny Kelly from Typo Negative and Danzig on drums. So um, it must be interesting. You know, you can do this stuff. You're, you're capable of doing this stuff. You get Dan. He's capable of doing his piece. But it must also be pretty um, – well, it says something about you that you're able to call on some of these people and they'll come in and help you. Um because most people burn bridges and most people go, you know, I'm out of here and that's the end of it. But for you to be able to do that, I mean, it says something about, you know, who you are. I, you know, they're my friends and, you know, they did me a favor. Uh, and Johnny has played on tracks before on our previous or on our first album, Love and Anger. Uh, he played a few tracks. Um, I'm fortunate to know people like that, you know. Uh, I would have loved for them to do the entire record. But, you know, Dan and I pretty much had it down. And we have a very, you know, I'm sitting here in my recording studio here in New Jersey. And um, I'm fortunate enough that we can make music, record, write and record music any at any time. You know, I have another band, Morning Noise, which is a band that I started in high school. So over over 40 years ago, let's put it that way. So we reunited and got a different singer and we put out an EP. And the way we tend to record now is we come down here, we write, we record everything the same day. Get it all done. Five, six hours, done. And it's just, it, it, it for that kind of music, right? For punk rock music, it actually works really well rather than go, Oh, and rehearse it and then come back and, and do it you know it kind of gives you that you know spontaneous thing right which to me i i love it i love it it puts you on the spot you have to do it you know having have your own uh, studio is great and then sometimes it's not good because you're not paying for time right so the only the only cost is it is your actual your own time so um you can go back and change things over and over and over because, oh, I'm not happy, I'm not happy. But at some point, you have to just go, we're done. We got, It's time to move on. Um, so that's... You know. Sorry, it's like we rehearsed this because it's like I was going to ask you where you have your own studio. Um, you know, and, you know, nobody's going, hey, you know, hurry up. You got to get out here, you know, 200 bucks an hour or whatever the heck it is. But do you find sometimes you'll walk away and maybe go to another part of your place and go, ah, oh, you know what? It could be something better, and you go back down, and you obsess over it? All the time. Yeah. Uh, all, all the time. And you go, oh, I, I could have done this. I could have done this. At the end of the day, really, it's your personal preference. If no one else knows the song at that point, who, who, what would they know? What, what difference would it be? Right. 
I, it's a look, it, you know, when you produce yourself, right. Um, you have to get in that mindset of putting it down, getting it, getting it down the best as you can, and then moving on because again, you, you'll sit there and I think you start wind up, you wind up, um, stopping the creative flow, right? Because you can go back and do it over and over and over. And before you know it, you've kind of like, you, you've overproduced it. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you can do, you know, you've heard of some albums that are done in 10 hours and then you've heard, you know, takes a band like Def Leppard four years to put something out. Um, and what's the fine line? Like, where do you get to the point where you just go like, okay, this is just getting silly, expensive. Is it, is it any better two months from now than it was two months ago? Well, case in point. Well, uh, I think it was Michael Jackson's, I think it was Beat It. And they did something like a hundred mixes. A hundred mixes. And at that time, everything was analog. So it's just stacks and stacks of tape. And they went back to the second mix. Out of a hundred yeah. mixes, they were back to number two. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, Sometimes that 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 the freshness. There is, and there's something to be because you know, people don't understand, you don't understand it. I get it. You know, there's a thing called music head where you just you start hearing things that aren't there and you'll do another take because you think something's not there and you gotta step away from it and exactly. Exactly. So Interesting to, so, you know, in terms of, I don't, did you guys do this as a traditional record where you go in, you lay the drums down first and layer it? Obviously, with two guys in the studio, and you bring guests in, you know, you can't do it live off the floor. Maybe you can in, in some way, but how, how was how was the process put together? So we we have a very interesting way of doing it. So, like, I come up with ideas, and I hum them into my memo part of my phone, uh, the voice memo. And then Dan would come down and we would sit here and I would I would hum it to him or or play it on the guitar and show him. And then we then I'd get behind the drums and we would start hashing it out. And within an hour, we had a full thing ready to be laid down. So it would be me and him. We'd have a scratch guitar track. Then he would come back and he'd put the bass down. So we had something to fill the bottom end. And then we go and we start, you know, the overdubs. Uh, for guitar, which basically were for rhythms. And then I would write the vocals. And once the vocals are tracked, then we would go and fill in around it. And, it, and to me, it's, it's a very simple process. Now, again, a lot of people are like, well, you, you know, uh, or a lot of people, what a lot of people do is they go and they'll write a song and then they go to a rehearsal studio and they rehearse it. It's like, well, I don't really want to do that. I think that that kind of takes away, like I said before, of that spontaneity thing of just let's get it let's get it down and let's move on and and trust me i don't like just put i won't put out anything like i guess there's songs that didn't make it to the record i didn't think they were that strong um i love like i come from as i told you before 50s elvis punk rock kiss dan comes from a very uh prog background mm. now prog music to me i'm not putting it down but i can't handle it because it's it's like where's the chorus where's the hook yeah. and i don't find that and i you know dan says i have add supreme which i probably do so i i can i can get on a treadmill i'll go through 60 songs in 30 minutes on on my on my phone right because i can't finish all whole song but um getting back to what we we're talking about is you know to do this process like this, it's just so much easier. We just get it done, move along. And, you know, <laughs> as you're talking, it's because, I mean, I, I play myself, and if if I'm paying for something, I want to be prepared. If somebody gets me on a track and they want to go, hey, come in the studio and jam on it, well, if they're paying on it, that's what they want, fine. Um, so there's the yang, there's the yang. I do think, though, it's very cool when you have access to – you know, a recording studio and a facility. And I don't know what you record in if you use Pro Tools or your old school, new school. But it's very cool to be able to have that, um, uh, you know, leeway to to record as you want to record. 
I've invested a lot of time, a lot of money into um, studio gear. And always you kind of have to keep up with it, right? So every few years you need a new computer because to keep up with the software of plugins and things like that requires more um, computer power, CPU power. Um, but now we've, uh, the just two years ago, Dan and I invested heavily into, like I said, a new computer, um, new uh, clock interfaces and things like that. So, you know, we should be set up for quite a while. And, you know, microphones, uh, Neumann microphones, Latin, uh, there's all different types. We've got them all. So so, so when you go out, it's, I, I, I'm assuming that your plan is to take this out and put it in front of some eyeballs, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we're working on right now. So you'll put a band together. Um, I'd be interested to get your take on, um, it's an up and down, I guess, hot topic, but the, the use of tracks live. Um, you hear guys like Eddie Trunk that just rage on it. You'll hear other people that are like, ah, it's no big deal. And some of the newer bands seem to think it's a necessity. What's your thoughts on that? Will you that be a necessity for you with what you guys have recorded with this? I don't think so. Um, we need two guitar players. Yeah. And I know one of them that I'm approaching and they, the one guitar player can play rhythm and the other needs to be creative with some effects, you know, um, and that's the, we, we recorded it in that manner for that reason that we need to reproduce this live. Uh, look, I, you know, there's a lot of bands that use tracks and it's funny that, you know, how, um, uh, you know, I understand what Eddie Truck means by that. I get it. But there's a lot of the bands that he's friends with that they're using tracks. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, he's pretty, he's selective. He's very, he's very laser focused on who he's directing it at. No question. Right. I, I get it. I get it. Look, there are bands out there. Um, I don't want to name names. They're using them, A, because they're a lot older. Mm -hmm. Some can't sing like they used to, right? So they need the help because they're still out there selling out arenas and whatnot. And, and again, you know, it's damned if you do damned if you don't, right. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, it's like a woman, right? You get a woman that's in her, let's call it fifties. So let's call it sixties. Go look at all the work she had done. Right. But, it, and if she didn't have the work, then they'd say, Look how old she looks. Right. Now. Yeah, no, that's right? a fair so statement. It's 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 one of those things where there are bands like um, a lot of the newer metal bands that all use tracks because they're so over. I don't want to say overproduced, but they're very produced in the studio. How do you duplicate that? Right. It's Def Leppard's one of them. Yeah. I mean, I I saw them play. I I think they're great. But you can't say you can't sit there and not hear the tracks. You can hear the tracks for sure. Um, it's funny because I can't I can't recall the band I was listening to, and this is about three or four months ago. The drumming was so precise; you could tell it was on a grid. There was no like it didn't wobble. And so I found this website that actually had nothing but drum tracks. So it had like uh, isolated drum tracks with John Bonham and, and Vinnie Apice, and I listened to it. And the magic with some of the flubs that you can't really hear on the albums that are there, but that's the part that I think is really missing from some of this stuff now. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if it's kind of like, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a big Beatles fan. I've learned to appreciate them as I've gotten older. But if you listen to some of their songs that were recorded, this is the Beatles, the biggest selling band of all time. If you listen to some of the recordings, you actually hear the mistakes in the song. Mm -hmm. Like if you listen to the song, Please Please Me, at one point, Paul is singing one word and John is singing another. And it's 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 a mistake. And, I, and I've actually, I, I Googled it and you can, they tell you it is a mistake, but they left it. You know, that's the human part of music. You know, it's, it's the reasons why Black Sabbath and Zeppelin why were they so friggin' good? It was the the flow, right? It, it it you know it grooved, you know. And Johnny Kelly is like that as a drummer. He's a he's a groove man, you know. 
It's swing. It, I shouldn't take. He swings. Yep. Like I hear him play with Quiet Riot, and he goes, "What do you think?" I go, "I've never heard Quiet Riot swing like that." People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because well, he, like Frankie Benal was on yeah. top of everything. Yeah. Uh, Johnny's kind of behind the beat, right? Because that's the way Johnny plays. He's just he swings, and nothing wrong with it. It's it's a, it's a gift to be able to do that. You know. It is a gift to be able to do that because not everybody can. And Right. And you try to put that, you know, again, a lot of these bands today, like you said, to the grid yeah. and, you know, to the click. And there's no swing. Yeah. And I mean, just for me, and I mean, you know, I'm gonna get, people are, always get mad at me when I say this, but I, you know, there's a lot of music that's out that I respect now, but I love the old like, Zeppelin and I mean, Kiss. I mean, <laughs> huge Kiss fan and, you know. Well, um I've I've read all the books, you know, on um how they recorded a lot of that stuff and with Bob Ezrin and, and and stuff like that, and it's pretty interesting. Again, listen, all those early albums, they were just, you know, you can hear it go up and down, and that's okay. It's absolutely classic. It's classic. Well, I was just trying to find. Um... Uh, I have it back here somewhere, but I get the reissue of uh, Heaven and Hell by Zepp or uh, Sabbath. And a lot of people, if you listen to that drum part, Bill Ward actually brings that down, right? And it's got this almost awkward sort of deal, but it makes it such a cool part of the song with what's going on with the bass and the, and the vocal line. And I just, those are just dynamics. I don't think you, you and I actually heard it in your, your thing. Like your, your tune was, if I'm sitting there and I said to Raquel, I said, this is, this is a new kind of throwbacky vibe that I I thought was great. I tried to marry it, you know, and and um, I don't uh, I don't use clicks. I'm not. Uh, I well, I've recorded with clicks before, uh, and it's actually easier. But like all of our uh, vocals and stuff, they're not copy and paste. That's really easy to do, yep. especially if you use a click. And but we we do everything live. So it just it's just much easier and it makes us work harder at it and, and which is fine. Again, I'm not putting anybody down that, that uses tracks. You know, you, there are people that could use them um and they're they're really creative with them. Uh we have a, a friend of mine who does tracks for for bands. That's what he does. And he puts together these redundancy systems so that they can use the tracks because you can't just plug in a computer and expect it. You know, what if the computer goes down? And they do, right? So you need two computers running side by side in redundancy so that if one goes down, the other one is hitting, you know? So oftentimes I'll, I'll chat with people and, you know, when I ask you beforehand, is there anything or that you want to avoid? And you obviously said no. Um, one of the things that uh, for, for my viewers that are going to, you know, they're going to go, Steve Wing, I know that name. I know that name. Why do I know that name? And why why do people know Steve Steve Zing? Because I mean, you've got a long history. You're not some guy that's just popping up here. You've been, you know, you've got you've got some background. Uh well, I mean, obviously I started with my band Morning Noise in the 80s. And we had this cult following for years and years. And like I said, it, everything was reissued a few years ago and, and there's new stuff coming out. And then of course uh i uh i had ended morning noise when i joined up with glenn danzig and we formed sam hain and so i did sam hain and then of course obviously being a member of danzig uh you know that doesn't suck either well so uh, up here and where i grew up in well it's halifax but there's a place called dartmouth where i'm actually from Sam Hain was a huge band when I was growing up. I mean, um, you know, the guys would be going around in the, with the leather jackets with the backpacks or the back patches, like in you know, in July when it was like blazing heat, but they they wore it with pride. And it just seemed to be one of those bands that uh, you know, people were they were very, 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 very loyal to that band. I you know, I've I've been I've been fortunate to be in some I I I I guess I can call it iconic bands. I mean, I don't think we had a sound like anybody else at the time. Uh, I think we influenced a lot of people, which 
you know, I'm happy about. I mean, anytime you can, and I don't care if you influence one person or a million people, the fact that you can influence just one person is, is I think is, I don't take that lightly. I don't take it for granted. It's, um, it's an honor to be able to do that. And it's a, pri- it, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Look, a lot of people that pick up an instrument will never get to do what I do. You know, that it's. I always like to chat with people from your neck of the woods because there's a very, um, no matter what genre of music you're playing, it just seems like there's a real vibe to, to Jersey, be it spring team, be it, um, you know, what was going on in the, the late eighties, be it, you know, the, the heavier scene, um, what is it about that that neck of the woods that uh, you know people are so? I don't know. They're just so distinctive when they're coming out of it. You know, there were so many bands that uh, like hard rock bands, um, whether it was metal, uh, punk, hair metal, that came out of Jersey. Pop, you know, obviously Whitney Houston and so on and so on. Uh, I think because of our proximity to New York. Mm-hmm. All right. So you kind of you kind of caught that vibe and, and the city being so close, you know, in 20 minutes I'm in Manhattan. Then the other part is like New Jersey was like at one point the cover band capital. Right. And that had to do, I think, well, at one point New Jersey had so many clubs and bars. And the Jersey Shore, which had so many clubs and bars, which they still do. And, and and all these bands, these cover bands and bands like Bon Jovi that got their start at the Jersey Shore and things like that. And I think, again, that influence from New York came across the bridge or the tunnel. And it really influenced a market. Uh, the kids at the time really wanted to be somebody. And they latched on to every different genre that was out there and i think that's that's kind of why uh new jersey again new york being the the largest city in the world and the uh, look what came out of new york right right i mean everything you name it 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 came from there in some way shape or form well i mean i lived in toronto for a number of years and toronto is like a mini new york but you have this it's a cultural melting pot of you know, different cultures and people and countries. And, and so, you know, you can go to a jazz club and then you go two doors down, you're in a rock club and you go two doors down, you're in a punk club. And um, it can't help, but kind of, you know, make it a unique kind of sound for, for any band. You know, the, the, the 60s, 70s, 80s were incredible times. Now, not, not, not for me, the 60s so much, because I don't, you know, I was born in the 60s, but, I think for for music and for New York, it was so important. No, let's let's even go back to the fifties, right? With Dion, uh, Dion and the Belmonts, and, and and bands like that, right? And then that influenced a whole bunch of other things. And look, Kiss was influenced by the New York Dolls, mm-hmm. uh, and so on and so on. And the Dolls never got the 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 success that they should have had or like the Ramones, right? The Ramones, while they Ramones were iconic, they still never had the, the, you know, the, the exposure like a green day, right? So the green green day to me was modern day Ramones, not as good. You know, (laughs) a band that I would put in that category would be a thin Lizzie. Everybody knows them, but if everybody that knew them bought their albums, they probably would have sold, hundreds of millions of copies of the records, right? It, you know, again, a, a different time. You know, timing in music is everything. If Kiss right. came out today, nobody would care. Right. And it and it and it's it's a very interesting time for music. You look at a guy like say Billy Joel who hasn't put out an album in 30 something years. Why? Because nobody wants to hear new music by Billy Joel. Right. Nobody wants to hear new music by a lot of bands. I think for those bands that are so established, 
they want to hear the music that takes them back to that time in their life where they had the, probably no problems at all. They were healthy. They were young. They were living life. And now they're at this state of whatever age they're in, an older, an older age. They've got mortgages. They've got grandchildren. They've got this. They got the problems of the world on their shoulders. But yet they'll go see them in concert because they want to be taken back to that time. And to listen to new music, I, you know, that's that's not going to do anything because most of that new music would be influenced by what's going on in today's world. You know, I'm not a political person. I don't care about the left, the right, the center. Uh, to me, it does no justice to me. It's smoke and mirrors. And I, I'm not a, I, not a politician. I don't think I'd ever write a song that would be political. And I don't like political artists. I mean, Dylan did it best, right? And, and he had something to say. He was young. He was talking about Vietnam. He was talking about all this stuff. You know, we're, we're so far ahead in, uh, in, in life today that how do you really, how do you really talk about it? Right? We got to write a song about the pandemic. Cares. We lived it for over two years. Great what point. Does mean? What is it going to mean? But that's what I'm saying. Like <laughs> people want to be brought back to a place in time where they were happy, and that's why it's really weird to make new music today, right? So I'm put. I put out a you know Cleopatra Records believed enough of me to put out this record of new music. I'm just hoping that I can inspire the people my age. Younger, of course, my age and maybe even older, because, again, all these people are grasping on all this old material. But what about now? You got to have something that can affect people now. Now, the established artists, they don't want to hear it. Mm. Like I said, they just want to go back in time and to that time where they were young and they had not a problem in the world except getting dressed to go out and impress other people. Well, and that's important. So, Bleeding Love is out tomorrow officially. Mm -hmm. um, my, I'm going to try to have my editor get this out in, in time at some point tomorrow so that it, it coincides. But where are my viewers going to find uh, find out? Because I told a couple of people that I was I was having this chat with you, and uh, the whole main thing was, oh yeah, this is this is incredible. So, where are they going to find this? Uh, not only the the single, but the record. Well, I know. Uh... It'll be released March 3rd um, worldwide, and but Spotify, obviously. Uh, I know it's on Spotify. I'm not sure if it's on. I don't know how Cleopatra does, but definitely Spotify. Steve Zing, I thought we were going to do two, break it up into two, but you know what? With the conversation was flowing, so I just let it roll. Um, what? Very nice to meet you, sir. Uh, I, I, I quite quite enjoyed this, and uh be looking forward to. Uh, I love the track, man. When uh, when uh, Ra uh, Raquel sent it to me, I was like, uh, you know, I always try to put my finger on stuff. And and you know, when I covered the influence thing with you, um, if you're like me, you're gonna know whether you like something in the first probably ten. You know, you're an A and uh, uh, Claude's an A and R guy, right? You know what? You're right because I turn music on, and you know, they say the first ten seconds of a song really is everything. And 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 not that I write songs like that, uh, but I, you know, again, I, I like the hook. Yeah, to me, the hook is everything. That's that's how you remember a song. I, I know so many bands that they learn how to write a riff and they put fifty riffs in a song, but they have no, there's no melody, there's no hook. It's just riffs, and it's gonna be interesting to see what happens, say, ten or twenty years from now, where all the iconic. Uh, musicians are dying off, right? I mean, look at Paul McCartney. He's 80 years old. His music gets played everywhere, yep. every day around the world. What are kids or, or kids of today, say that are, say, 15 years old, when they're 40, what are they going to be listening to? Right. Is it Rihanna? Is it Jay-Z? Is it Betty Wap? I don't know. But I don't, it, it's kind of interesting, like 80s music, right? Mm-hmm. Between let's say 1982 to 1986, you could turn on a radio anywhere in the world and you hear something from that job that time period every day. Yep. Right? And the kid, the kids all know it because their parents grew up know. on it. Yep. That's exactly it. Yep. So um, you know what if we could if we could make something new that people could latch onto for the future, that would be great. 
Fantastic. Sir, very nice to meet you, and I wish you nothing Same but here. the best of luck. Uh, I'm going to be following this, and uh, I promised uh, Raquel that I would get back to her and say that we, we got this done fair and square. Um, awesome. Best of luck, sir. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time. Steve Zane, ladies and gentlemen.